Hi, uh, Dr. Hennessy. So, um, if we can start our dialogue now. Okay. Uh, We're ready. Oh, all right. It's great. Thanks so much. Yeah. I'll, I'll, okay. Let's begin. <laughs> Okay. Hi, Dr. Hennessy. I'm He Jun, the founder of TMT Post. I'm very honored to invite you to participate in the Edge Conference hosted by TMT Post. I'm also glad to have this opportunity to have such a unique dialogue he why with you, especially between 2021 and 2022, a historical period of special significance. TMT Post has been committed to promoting scientific and technological innovation exchanges between China and the world. So, the first question I think is something you are very familiar with about Scenic Valley. You have witnessed the development of Scenic Valley and the birth and the rise of many technology giants, such as Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, and so on. Scenic Valley has been good at going from nothing to something, or to say, from zero to one, but China excels in going from one to more. So um, what do you think the differences between these two models? What are key ingredients for the Scenic Valley Innovation Hotbed? Well, I think, I think you're right in contrasting these two models. Uh, China has been exceptional in the development, particularly around manufacturing technologies and high-tech manufacturing. They have done a remarkable job, uh, not only in figuring out how to make that manufacturing efficient, but to do it at very high quality levels. Um, and they've managed the supply chain really well. Um, right now, we see the whole world is in angst over supply chain uh, issues, but I know China is, is doing quite well. Uh, the U.S., I think you, you correctly stated, is good at creating the first of something. And if, if it's in software, then it's pretty easy to replicate. If, if it involves hardware, it's a lot harder to replicate because it involves a manufacturing aspect. So I think both of those models uh, can learn from the other and can learn and get a better understanding of how to become the initial innovator in the case of China, or how to scale up things really efficiently, something which uh, the US outside of the software industry has struggled a bit with. Um, and, and I think, I think we, we see, you know, what's most amazing to me mm. is to see China really succeed as this highly entrepreneurial economy and technology uh, mindset. And it, it's been remarkable to watch over the last 20 years uh, as it really has emerged and changed dramatically. Oh, thank you for your very good comment to for the Chinese entrepreneurs. Yeah. So mm -hmm. compared with the era when technology companies such as Apple, Google, Facebook were born in Silicon Valley earlier, what other uh, evolution of the Silicon Valley model in these years and what challenges may be encountered in the future? Well, I think one, one big change that's occurred is the scale of the companies and the financing which they require. Um, they're, they're moving into markets which um, perhaps uh, are not as profitable early on um, and uh, as a result are consuming far more capital. Uh, their great example of this is to look at Google, a company which received about $20 million in total financing prior to going public uh, and was actually profitable when they received their first venture capital investment. Um, and Uber, a more recent example, which required $25 billion to just break, pro just get profitable, barely profitable at $25 billion of investment. So the scale of these companies and the rate at which they're being built has been shifted dramatically by the availability of capital um, and, and the amount of capital that's being deployed. Of course, they're deploying it on top of a very well-based infrastructure, which didn't exist uh, earlier when Apple and Google and Amazon uh, were created. I think we're also seeing a shift towards more companies that are B 
business model innovators rather than technology innovators. Of course, Amazon was a business model innovator primarily, uh, although they've done a lot of technology since then, but they started out by switching to e-commerce and using a business model, while mm -hmm. Apple and Google were both technology-based uh, companies. But now we see lots of innovations around the business model. Mm -hmm. And the third thing I'd say is there are now five or six companies being founded every time there's a new idea. So there are many companies rushing to the same space, mm -hmm. uh, which means that lots of things, lots of uh, quirks may determine which ones are successful. How much capital do they have? How good is the management team? Uh, lots of things beyond the initial idea of what they were going to focus on. And that's a, that's a real change. I think we'll certainly see new challenges as these companies um, uh, come about. Uh, the, the venture model has shifted over time. You know, when I started my first company 40 years ago, uh, roughly a third of the companies coming out of Stanford were successful at some level. Today, probably less than 10% or 10% are successful. So we have <laughs> some really big successes, but lots of lots of failures. And that's a, that's a real change in how the venture market operates uh, over, over the last 40 years. Mm. Yeah, it's it, it's um more and, and it's more and more difficult for the entrepreneurs to be success. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So it, it is related to another question about success is the leadership. So it is reported that you know there are not many people with strong leadership capability, either in governments, academic or enterprises. Uh, so uh, we are making efforts to uh, cultivate the next generation leaders. Please share with us your insight in fostering future leaders. Well, it is true that uh, I, after I had stepped down as Stanford president, I became really dismayed over the quality of leadership that we saw around the world, both as you pointed out in government, in the academy, but also in industry. Uh, and I decided that to really build a, a, a program at Stanford that would bring really incredible graduate students from around the world uh, to, and help develop their leadership skills, not just their academic major skills, but really develop their leadership skills. And, and what we've discovered, leadership is really something that you learn in an experiential fashion. It's not just, you can't just learn it by reading a textbook about it or sitting in a classroom. You have to deploy the ideas, you have to deploy the, the techniques. And so we've developed a, a model of what kinds of characteristics we're looking for first in the, in the students we select, mm -hmm. what things we want to develop in them, what things we want to teach them, everything from how to convey your thoughts, tell a story, paint a picture of something, to how to deal with difficult issues, how to make decisions when there's uncertainty, um, ethical principles, how do you steer your ethical course appropriately? And these things are a foundation that we try to educate our, our scholars on so mm -hmm. that when they come, go out into the real world and are faced with the challenges that you face in a real setting, um, that they will be able to uh, not just survive, but really thrive and really uh, take the institution they're leading to new heights. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, so, um, uh, because of the time limit, I would like to have the next question about the fundamental research, and I think it's also related to the innovation of entrepreneurs and also their leadership in the next, uh, ne next uh, future. So, um, you have a very extensive experiences in academic research and the startup creation and also big company operation like Google, quite different from universities, I think. So, um, what kind of research environment does the enterprises need in your views? Is there an inherent conflict between capital and uh, tech innovation? Well, so my deeply held belief is that the long-term commitment, the long-term focus that both the university needs and a company needs is on innovation, mm -hmm. is on creating new things. So many great companies get stuck 
doing the same thing and are unable to break out of the mold. And eventually, what made them successful holds them back as it gets obsoleted by new products and new directions. Um, mm. Universities, likewise, also have to constantly change. If, if the faculty we're hiring today um, did the same thing that I did when I was hired, we're making a mistake. We have to hire in new directions and move in new, new directions. So that innovation uh, structure is, is quite critical in both cases. Keeping that alive, making sure that you're thinking about how to constantly grow and get new products is a very hard thing to do in a company because when a company becomes successful, it very naturally puts more capital into the things it's been successful and doesn't fund the new things that are going to make the difference in the longer term. And that, that's the conflict you've got to break. It's the conflict the management team and the board really have to focus on and think um, innovatively about. Mm -hmm. So how about the capital? Because many people in China that and they will think that the capital will be their, um, it, uh, the capital is not a good thing now for their innovation and for their so uh, fundamental research because many people want to make money they'll say don't don't uh, don't like to do some things to to make more res research of their science so <laughs> yeah so uh, you know one of the one of the things that happens to me frequently here at Stanford is I have young students come up and say I want to be an entrepreneur and I say, okay, tell me about your, your creation, your new technology, what you've invented that's going to make a successful new company. And they said, well, I don't have it yet, but I want to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I said, great entrepreneurs, great companies are built around innovations. Mm. Not, capital is the tool that you use to promote that innovation. The, you know, the remarkable thing, if you look at the history of Silicon Valley, there have been lots of companies started. Some came out of the university, some spun out of other companies. But the university generated a lot of the interesting companies which redefined the entire market. The internet, mm -hmm. the World Wide Web, uh, search in the case of Google, um, the personal computer in the case of Apple. Um, mm -hmm. those, were, those were concepts that came out of a deep thinking about what goes on in the universities. And I think they continue to play that kind of role. Mm -hmm. Mm. So it reminds me of another um, important question is that uh, it's about the uh, model play. So what do you think of the relationship between innovation and the model play of technology companies? And so um, Google, Amazon and Apple have all experienced antitrust events. What do you think of the model play challenge faced by technology giants? Will technology innovation eventually become a game for big technology giants like, like that? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, uh, I, I think it's, it's hard to say, you know, so many new things in technology are first created by young companies, which uh, create a new product that obsoletes some big company's product. And I don't think that's going to end. I think that's going to continue. Mm -hmm. the, interesting, the interesting challenge in companies like Google, Amazon, and Apple is they have built themselves as large companies primarily by innovating internally, by organic growth, not by acquisition. So acquisitions are usually the place in which you worry about monopolies. You worry about somebody buying out a company in another space. The classical examples in the U.S. were Standard Oil, right, which then bought out the railroads and unified railroads and the oil business and created a monopoly between the two. But Google, Amazon, and Apple have primarily been internal innovations where mm. the companies have grown organically because they've invested, made deep technology investments, um, and, and those have been the secret of their success. I think that creates an, an, uh, an interesting dilemma because you don't want to discourage companies from innovating by, by mm. making organic investments in the company. That would be a terrible thing. Mm -hmm. for innovation in the in, in the country um, but that's the challenge um, that we face is think, how do you think about these companies that have grown by uh, smart investment in their own technology mm -hmm. so 
what is the most important factor in turning uh, never science into a product into a market like yeah, that's a very good question. I, I, it's a topic I've talked on many times. Um, this whole process of taking a discovery in the university and turning it into a product, or for example, a discovery in a research laboratory in a company and turning it into a product. And the most important insight is that you don't transfer that technology by publications or by technology thrown at the wall. You transfer it with people people become the way in which you transfer technology. And if you go back to Stanford's and the origins of Silicon Valley, Hewlett and Packard left the university, left Stanford to go start their company. Jerry Yang and Dave Philo left to go start Yahoo. Larry Page and Sergey Brin left to go start Google. Um, Mendel Rosenblum and several of his students left to go start VMware. You, you mm. can't just, you can't just write papers and assume that industry will pick up the technology. The inventors have to be part of that process. So you, I always tell people, you don't transfer technology, you transfer people with oh. the technology. So transfer people. So uh, uh, can you ex explain more about the people? I think it's a very interesting uh, concept like that, yeah. Yeah, I think the the, the reason this is so important that, that people are involved in it, when, when you invent a new technology, particularly if it's a lab prototype, right? What we invented at Stanford when we were working on risk technology, it was a prototype. It wasn't ready to be a product. It was a demonstration of concept. Mm -hmm. Same thing with lab work, um, particularly when you get into the biomedical area. A, a laboratory effect is a long ways from uh, a drug that's ready to start giving to people. It's a long haul to go from there to there. But that's always true. New battery technologies, it's the same thing. There's a big gap between demonstrating something that works in a lab to build a battery of one mm -hmm. and being able to make tens of thousands of batteries that reliably work. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, but a key thing is that the people who worked on the technology they see, they see the possibilities of the technology in an optimistic fashion. They see the glass as half full. People outside often think this was not invented here. This, this glass is half empty. It's not going to be able to transfer. Um, it's that commitment. And of course, that's, the, that's the, the drive that an entrepreneur has to have. They have to believe that this technology will work because if they don't believe it'll work, they're never going to get there. Mm. And there, mm, it's, it's very, it's also uh, another very interesting uh, question is that uh, we found that some scientists do not buy what Elon Musk has argued for in terms of science, um, because um, different people have different ideas in the, in the different positions, I think. So do you think there is a barrier between entrepreneurs and the scientists? If yes, what is it? If not, why? I, I don't know that there's necessarily a barrier. Um, I think Elon is one of the great conceptualizers. I mean, if you think about what he's done at Tesla, he didn't really fundamentally have to invent a lot of new technology, right? He's using conve conventional batteries packaged differently. But what he did was he said, we're going to build an electric vehicle we're going to redesign every single aspect of the vehicle. So we're go I remember going down and seeing the first prototype of the Tesla Model S. It, they were just in the, in the factory down in Los Angeles, and that wasn't a product for another year. And he showed me it, and he, he said simple things like, well, you don't have a drive shaft, so you don't have to have a hump where the drive shaft runs through the back of the car anymore. And he had reconfigured the entire car, taking advantage of the fact that he had the batteries, but he didn't have a motor. He didn't have an engine. So he could rethink the whole car. That's what he's really great at. It's the same thing with SpaceX. He's really great at reconceptualizing the problem in a different way that, than people have done before. That's a different skill set than, let's say, somebody doing basic science who's trying to discover something new and has deep knowledge in a space um, and trying to create a different knowledge. But both are important. They, they, have to, they have to work together. 
Um, mm. Entrepreneurs need new science and new discoveries in order to create new products and new companies. Um, and, and, the, and the scientists need the entrepreneurs in order to convert their concepts, their discoveries into, into successful things that benefit society. Mm. But in but I find that in in China it's very difficult to make scientists and entrepreneurs work together. Uh, it's not an easy thing. So and can you give us some suggestion, uh, like from the Stanford University experience, how to make their work together? <laughs> yeah, I think for us, what's really what's really worked is having people who've successfully tried the entrepreneurial journey. So the university. First of all, the university um, encourages people who really believe that their technology is, their discovery is significant, to think about how they might commercialize it. And we view that as, that, that, that's part of our commitment to society. If we discover something that can improve the way we do things in the world, then all the better that it turns into a company and benefits society. That's a, that's a plus for uh, it's an important plus for the individual, but also for the company, for the university in terms of um, giving back to society, not just making the discovery, but seeing it benefit society. Uh, what's helped us over the years is having people who've gone down that road, been a scientist, taken their technology out, commercialized it, and understand the process. So there are lots of people now like that at Stanford that means it's fairly easy to find somebody who can mentor or can give feedback to a young scientist who's thinking, I have a really great invention. How could I possibly turn this into a product? Well, well, they just have to look around their lab. There's somebody probably not very far away at the university who's gone down that road and understands how to do it. That's the way to really make it work. Mm. Okay, great. Thank you. And so let's talk more about the trends and uh, also their Future waves, though. Um, we know that innovations come in waves. So in your views, what is the next wave or the field that spawn brilliant world-class tech firms? I think it will be very important for the startups and also entrepreneurs to make more preparation. <laughs> well, we are, we, are, we are at the beginning still, but it's clear it's here in the middle of the wave for AI and machine learning. Mm -hmm. This, but I, I think we are actually closer to the beginning of this wave than the end, despite the fact that it's already made enormous changes in technology. It, it is going to continue because the breakthroughs that we made in machine learning are less than a decade old. Um, and they're going to play out, at, particularly as we learn where that rate at which discoveries are being made in this space is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Uh, the number of papers being written, the number of improvements being made, the rate of progress. So I think we're going to see the next two decades dominated by the use of this technology and the insights in machine learning across the entire information technology field. Um, it, it's going to change the way we do things. It's going to change the way we build computer systems, the way we build cloud-based systems, the way we build data centers, the way we build databases, the way we build everything. Is, is going to be changed by this. And there are going to be many companies which are created by taking that technology and applying it to a particular sector mm. in the same way that um, uh, Oracle or, or Salesforce applied their technology to particular sectors, right? Financial accounting information or applied it to sales. Um, I think we'll see many examples of machine learning technology applied to various sectors, the financial sector, healthcare. The opportunities in healthcare alone are enormous mm -hmm. to apply this technology and really, really try to make improvements in how we do healthcare. Um, you know, mm -hmm. a dream I have is that someday we'll have a we'll have a mechanisms with machine learning and using machine learning and AI that will predict the next pandemic before it becomes a pandemic, which would obviously save a lot of lives and, and prevent a lot of economic destruction. So I think we're just in the beginning. You know, downstream, there are other technologies, uh, whether quantum computing possibly, or some other replacement for silicon technology is clearly going to be needed. 
Uh, I not sure it's quantum computing yet, but quantum probably has a role to play in that. Um, that's an area where we're still in the science part of it largely and just really understanding the science um, and, and what role it might play. But I think it has great, op great potential downstream. Oh, it's a great idea about the future. Yeah. So there, because of the pandemic, I think the world will change or not. So the whole world will change. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, the world has absolutely changed. I mean, an area which I'm really excited about is, you know, that the pandemic forced us all to go to Zoom and all of us who are in the education business to go to online education. And I think we've actually learned some things about that. And I'm hoping we can build better ways to do education and better ways to make high quality education available mm -hmm. to people around the world, particularly in those countries that don't necessarily have access to it. Um, that would be a great contribution to human society. Mm -hmm. Like you have talked about that the world has changed a lot in recent years. So are there differences between Google today and the Google before 2018? Uh, in that year, I know you joined the Google. So what do you think of Google's slogan, don't be evil? According to your uh, observation, what is the most critical factor for Google's success? Well, Google has changed a lot. I actually joined the Google board long before that. That's when I became chair of the board, but I actually joined the board back in 2005, 2006. Oh, um, okay. So a long time ago, uh, <laughs> and it was still a small company. It was still a small company. It, it had uh, a few th thousands of employees. It now has more than 100,000 employees. So it, it's changed a lot over time. Um, the initial slogan, don't be evil is a sl slogan that says what you shouldn't do as opposed to what you should do. Um, it was a fine slogan for the company early on. I think moving the slogan to something that's positive, do good for the world, uh, mm -hmm. improve your user experience, make things better for your users, I think is, is key. You know, I think Google's success is built on two things. First, trust. Search should always, always, always return the thing which you think is most important to the user. So mm -hmm. make search as good as you can and as unbiased as you can so that you, you think you're trying to give the user the very best thing in reply to their search. Mm -hmm. So that's been key and a trust relationship with users is based on that. And the second is constant improvement. Measurement, improve, measure, improve, measure, improve constantly try to make things better so that the user experience is better and that the, um, you know, one, one of the things we did along the way was we decided we, we would show fewer advertisements, but try to show better advertisements. And that turned out to be good for users and good for advertisers. Um, so we try to constantly measure things and improve them. Um, there's a system we use called OKRs, Objectives, Key Results. And we're constantly trying to say, here's what we're trying to do, accomplish in this. Here's how we're going to measure ourselves. And then we measure, are we doing well? Are we hitting our targets? So we do better, we need to double down here. So that constant improvement and measurement is really crucial. Mm -hmm. So how do you look forward to the future of Silicon Valley and Google? Please share with us your outlook, yeah. <laughs> well, I think, I think, I think we, you know, the key to the Valley's success over time has been to constantly innovate to be able to catch new waves of technology as they've come along. You know, when I when I arrived at Stanford, um, uh, the personal computer didn't exist yet. It was prior to the beginning of the personal computer. There were no cell phones. There was no internet. There was a little thing called ARPANET that a few academics used, but no real internet, no World Wide Web. Each one of those innovations, first the personal computer and engineering workstation in the 80s, then slightly later in the 80s, the, the internet, then the World Wide Web, um, then mobile uh, technologies, uh, then social media have all generated enormous opportunities to create new technologies and deploy them. I, I, I'm hoping that's just going to continue, <laughs> that we're going to discover new ways to use uh, technology 
uh, to help people and improve lives. And certainly we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us uh, in terms of problems we have to work on. The environment, a giant problem, which we really haven't brought that much technology to yet, but I think we, we, we need to start doing it. Uh, education around the world, healthcare. These are enormous problems where I think we're, we're not, we haven't yet done everything we could do for societies around the world. And so those are opportunities to innovate and create. And I think the Valley uh, will continue to be a place that tries that kind of innovation. And I think Google will, will try to do that as well. Mm -hmm. Good. So it reminds me of something that from Facebook and uh, Microsoft that they are talking about the metaverse. So it's uh, also a new technology trend for the world. <laughs> you know, I, I think we're still trying to figure out the role of, of these alternative technologies of both virtual reality and augmented reality and, and find how do we use these technologies efficiently? We know they work well for games and things and a few other things, but we, but the games are not, they're fine. They're important, they're important market of their own. Um, but it's not the market that's going to change the world. It, it may be entertainment's important, but it's not everything. I want to think, how do we build something that really helps people learn some new skills in a different way? Mm -hmm. How do we build something that really improves healthcare around the world? Um, really understands how to treat people better and how to bring breakthroughs to, uh, to the treatment of people. Mm -hmm. you know, what, what, what technologies can we bring to deal with the issues of climate change and climate resilience that are going on? Mm -hmm. Those are the really critical things I'd like to see us work on and to see us explore technologies for. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, if you are, so the next question is already uh, interesting or meaningful for, for China, I think. <laughs> yeah. If you are asked to ask some questions to Chinese entrepreneurs, what are the most important questions you want to ask? It's a interesting <laughs> question. So the first thing I'd ask them is, why do, you be, why do you want to be an entrepreneur? And the reason I want to ask them the question is, if they talk about making a lot of money, that's not what I want to hear. What I want to hear is, I have a technology which I think will improve things for people, and I want to build that technology and deliver it to people. I want to build a company that can do that. That's the answer I want to hear. Mm -hmm. Then I want to know something about what is, what is the innovation in their technology, and how are they going to create real leadership in that technology so that so that they can't simply be squashed by a little company coming, another company coming along and deciding, well, we're going to build that technology. What do they have? How are they going to get their focus? How are they going to get their drive? Are they going to be focused? You know, mm -hmm. what I, the one thing I tell startup companies is you have to make your first product successful because if you don't make your first product successful, it's over. If you make your first product successful, then you get to do a second product. And if you make that successful, then you might actually stay around and become a real company. So you've <laughs> got to think constantly about that. And, uh, you know, small companies have limited resources, mm -hmm. um, but what they really have is, is drive. And they, have a, they should have a group of entrepreneurs that are really committed to the idea and to the vision of the company. And that's what I want to, that's what I want to understand in a, in a startup company. So if, if they want to go overseas to be a global company like Google, like Facebook, so um, what do you um, think? Uh, or um, can you give some advices for them, for Chinese companies? Yeah. Sure, I, I think, I think m m many, many companies are global now. They, they've expanded. Um, in fact, th this is a real change in the last 20 or 30 years in Silicon Valley. Um, Many years ago, companies hesitated to go global until they got to a certain size, until they got pretty big. Now they start really early and begin to go global uh, earlier. And I think that's an important change. Um, and, and thinking about how you build that up, what are the strengths? How are the markets similar? How are the markets different um, in, in different countries? And how do you respond to that? Uh, how do you become a successful company that's um, that's admired in both settings. 
that, that's a real challenge, but I think it's something we see increasingly uh, in great companies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, finally, we always hope to promote more scientific and technological innovation exchanges between China and the world. For more global innovation exchanges, what do you hope for the future China and the U.S. relations? You know, I, I certainly hope that we can uh, continue to collaborate. Science is best pursued as a global open uh, endeavor that people from all around the world can contribute. You know, I, I think back to some of the earliest exchanges between China and the United States. And uh, besides ping pong, uh, the other, the other uh, big exchange was early visits from universities. And in fact, um, the person who was president when I arrived at Stanford went on the first academic uh, trip to China um, back in the, it would have been in the 1970s. Oh, uh, and the first, yeah, in the 1970s, the very first uh, academic exchanges were then. Um, you know, we've had incredible students come to the US from China over time. And, and we've had many of our graduates go back to China uh, in this, both, both in the academic setting, but also in the highly entrepreneurial economy that's emerged over the last 20 years in China. I think those exchanges are good for both countries. They really exchange viewpoints um, and help w with that kind of connection. You can build a global collaboration that'll work on important problems um, because the big problems we have to solve in the world won't be solved by one country. They'll be solved by collaboration from many countries. And starting that collaboration on science and technology, I can't think of a better place to start it. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> good. Thank you so much. And uh, um, time flies. Thank you so much for uh, Professor Hennessy again for accept, uh, accepting my invitation. Uh, some of today's questions also come from TMT Post users and uh, your fans. They are um, they are very concerned about our dialogue today, and the response is very enthusiastic. Uh, your sharing just now was very wonderful, and I gained a lot also. Uh, that's all for the dialogue here today. I hope we will have a chance to continue the dialogue in the future, and I. Um, I'm looking forward to meet you again um, in future that we can meet in China. Uh, someday you <laughs> can come to China. <laughs> okay, I'm looking forward much. to it. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm looking forward to coming to China again. Oh, good. So I hope that day will we'll come soon. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep in touch. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day.